What's up guys and gals and welcome to Weekly Indie Newcomer, our Friday series where we hang out for a little bit and play an indie game that's been rattling around my collection over the course of the last week. This week we're checking out Oceanhorn, Monster of Uncharted Seas, which is actually an iOS port, but it's not necessarily a linear parallel port. They've actually done a lot of work to turn it into a fully fledged out computer game. And so without further ado, there's going to be a lot of stuff to do in this episode, and I want to make sure that we see at least the basic gameplay tenets before we go much further. I've spent probably three or four hours with the game. I've enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Strangely enough, I came into this one very, very cynical for some reason. I don't know why. It might just be the fact that it's a Zelda-like, but I felt myself just sort of being like, eh, I don't know if I want to feature this one. But after I sat down and I played it for a little while, I was like, alright, so some of the rough edges are there. You can definitely tell that it's an indie outfit. But at the same time, Corn Fox and Bros, they've made a solid game right now. Now, they haven't announced a price point for the game just yet, and so it's going to be very difficult for me to give a recommendation until I know how much it's going to cost on the PC. So, there it is. I mean... I have no idea whether they're going to carry over the iOS cost, or if because they upgraded the game, they're going to convert it to a PC cost that's higher. Not sure right there, so I'll talk about the recommendations at the end, but let's get riding. tonight and I'm not coming back, kid. My fate is tied to a monster from the depths of time. Ocean Horn. I hear its horrible sound echoing from the sea. It is coming for me again. This is all happening sooner than I thought, and I am forced to act. Whatever happens next, I'm not going to lose you like I lost your mother. This necklace is the last thing left of her. Keep it close and guard it well. I will give you my old notebook for my travels. It will guide your way to an island of a friend. He will help you to prepare for what is coming. You know I'm asking too much of you. But this is the only way to stop Ocean Horn. Wake up. The time has come. Alright, so anytime an adventure starts out with the ghostly levitation of one of my neck accessories, I instantly take notice. Welcome to Oceanhorn. This is Oceanhorn. The game, like, controls exactly as you would expect it to, so no shenanigans from the iOS. We've got ourselves WASD to run around like we are right now. You will always attack towards your mouse cursor, so keep that in mind. Regardless of the way that you're traveling, like, you will most of the time attack towards, or at least it will pull back towards your mouse cursor, so just get used to that now. Along the way, we're going to be collecting coins because we got to buy some stuff. But what is... Oceanhorn. Let's talk about it for a second because some of these little things around here are going to be stuff that you've seen already. We can run up on pots. If you're taking a look at the upper right hand corner of the screen, I think you can probably figure out for yourself what the game is trying to emulate. This game is continuing in the tradition of games like Alundra and Zelda in creating a top down isometric world in which you will solve puzzles, run around, enjoy some action gameplay, and have the best time that you possibly can with the world that's been put in front of you. I was initially very cynical about this game because recreating the magic that is Zelda or the magic that is a game like Alundra or really is or however you say that game it's YS I don't know if it said Y's or is or I don't know I've never played it before and I've never heard anybody say it out loud but games like those 
Part of the thing is that the, the worlds are very, very well crafted. Without a well crafted world with decent lore, likable characters, I love the way the bugs run around when you break the bushes, that's really, really awesome. It's just like one of those small immersive effects. I'm not going to be reading any of these over here. Everything on screen is pretty self-explanatory. Health hearts, you've got yourself your action bar over here, so F will do magic later on. Left mouse button will hit with your stick. Right mouse button doesn't do anything right now, and then space is a contextual menu that changes depending on what you are looking at. Did you sleep well, kid? Do you still have the same nightmare? Your father often visited this island on his travels when he was younger. Alright. Inside his cottage, you will find we can't interact with the houses and go in and see all the random knickknacks that he has laying around. Unfortunately, we can't give his knickknacks a paddywhack. It's, it doesn't work like that. We can throw them. So just in case you want to continue the long tradition of RPG action games allowing you to jump up RPG, I guess it would be RPG action adventure. I mean, they're combining a lot of genres with games like Zelda. But anyways, if you like destroying people's personal property, you can continue to do it in this game and destroy that property I shall. Don't forget your training. Run around the island a few more times. Alright, well they want me to run around the island for right now. You can sprint contextually. I'm gonna beat up this little sponge monster over here. Doesn't it look like the thing that in Adventure Time, it looked like the thing that Jake and Finn, it looks like the little creature that they rescued, but then it had to go back to its mom because it started to wither because it partied out. I don't remember what it was called. It might have had a name, but it's been too long since I've seen that episode. Let's head back over here. Don't go in water. Water is pretty fatal. It's not instantaneously fatal. You can swim for a little while, but... Watch out for it. That's a save checkpoint, so when you walk past those, it's going to save your progress. Just in case the worst befalls you and you end up impaled, beetle stomped, or otherwise destroyed. I'm going to smack this. No, Skull Beetle, no. Ow! All I have is a meager stick with which to defend myself. How dare you, sir? I don't even have a real weapon. Ooh, a heart container in a bush. Well then, we apparently stole somebody's heart, and whoever stole it put it in a bush. Somebody stole somebody's heart anyways. I'm going to go down here because we don't really have the means to fight these things right now. We need a block, and we'll get that out of this cave right here. Into the cave we go. We're going to solve our first little set of puzzles right here. Shouldn't be too difficult. Off to the left, we're going to find the first key. I like the way that they've made sure to distinguish the game from iOS ports. And as a YouTuber that does first impressions videos, like seriously, I get so many iOS ports, like loads of them. I don't feel good about this monster right now, and he is like working me. I'm going to do my best to maybe stay out of his reach. There we go. So now that he's down, you might be wondering what those little gemstones are that we're picking up that are accumulating underneath our health. They are gems, and that much should be like really self-explanatory at this point because I already called them gemstones. But as you accumulate them, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to level up. And as you level up, the game has a light RPG mechanic in it. They're essentially gems of XP. So as you accumulate those, you're going to be able to level up a little bit. As you level up, it's going to unlock perks for your boat. Did I mention you get to sail around? Indeed, you get a boat and some other cool stuff here. So we got a regular key. A plain old boring old key. The key's like, hey man, I just had a regular key. You didn't have to add a whole bunch of detractors to it. I mean, you can add adjectives if you want, but I think I'd rather stick with regular for right now. At least that means that my fiber intake is where it needs to be. Let's go ahead and pop this door open real fast. There it is. And then we'll continue our way through the dungeon. Now over on this side, I think... Let's see, that's going to open that up, and I think blue ones stay compressed. Yeah, blue ones stay compressed, so they don't have to have, need to have constant pressure on top of them. Let's continue to whack some bushes, because we could use some health, and if we can get a heart container out of one of these bad boys, I would appreciate it. I don't know whether they're bad boys or not. They might be just paragons of virtue within the bush society. But for right now, we've got enemies in front of us. There it is right there, so an extra hit might help us out. That bat over there is hostile, by the way, in case you were wondering. That switch will reset puzzles. For right now, what we need to do is carry these flames over to these red pedestals, or these red buttons. When you drop them on top, red means that it has to have something continuously on top of it, or else it will reset. And so this game doesn't do a whole lot of things that are unique or original. As you can see, it doesn't have a whole lot of original ideas, but what it does have is a good grasp on old ideas, which... There's something to be spoken of right there. There are a lot of games that try and do what Zelda and Alundra and Iz have done in the past and fail at it miserably, even recycling almost verbatim the mechanics that are available. But for whatever reason, this game manages to be, like, really charming. You got back your mother's necklace. It seems like it is no ordinary pennant. And so, honestly, when you're looking at a game that is as polished as Zelda, the ability to at least replicate some of the mechanics in a way that remind you of the process that you've seen in previous games is a feat in and of itself, especially since the game was probably working with a very, very small team. Let's crack the chest open right here. 
got ourselves a sword and shield, which is obviously the beginning part of any Zelda-esque adventure. So you see what I mean? You start your adventure off by getting a sword and shield, like it very much follows in the footsteps of the games that it admires. I think you have to hit these. Yeah, you have to hit them in order for them to work properly, and that'll open the door so that we can climb back out of the cavern and continue the storyline along. But like I said, it definitely, it treads very, very cautious ground. But at the same time, it's an enjoyable experience, and so I don't want to give away too much right now. That'll open up right here, but every island that I've been to so far, the game doesn't really hold your hand. I mean, you've kind of got to explore and find random things, and you will, you'll see what I mean in just a second, but the game does have a very large open world that you can wander around with lots of islands that you can have adventures on, and so lots of cool stuff to be found here. I think we need to go back to the old guy's hut. So I guess we're going to do the hut hut hike, is what you could call it. Ah Football related humor! Ow! I don't have any beetle related humor, so unfortunately I'm just going to have to get pounded in the face by a beetle. He gave me a headbutt. We just got headbutted in the face. How do you start an adventure by getting headbutted? It's not off to a good start. Headbutts hurt. They're no fun. I mean, anything that combines the word head and butt. I don't want my butt involved with my head at all, so... You found your father's sword and shield! How did you get your hands on them? You are supposed to have them later. What?! Your mother's necklace started to glow. Ah, uh, how could I be so stupid? That's one of the symbols of ancient Arcadia. Follow me, I have a story to tell you. A long time ago, these islands were the mighty kingdom of Arcadia. The Age of Enlightenment led Arcadians to outstanding scientific discoveries. Engineering and magic ran deep in their blood. A foul war began as Dark Lord Mesmeroth, who had once been a promising candidate for an Archmage, led dire folk armies to a war against Arcadia. With the aid of his dark magic and the dire folk, Mesmeroth dug deep into the ground and brought to daylight something that should have stayed in the depths of the earth. Triloth a mass of dark energy left over from the creation of the world. Black boats arrived to the gates of Arcadia, carrying the dark energy Triloth. Soon the light from the world and from the hearts of men faded. The once flourishing society disappeared into the darkness. After the catastrophe, three sea monsters appeared. One of them was Ocean Horn. Oh, it is a vile creature, born under the dark burning light of Triloth. Although all of these monsters were powerful, only one has survived up to this day. Oh, it is getting late, kid. Return to me in the morning. And return we shall. So it's back to our tent to sleep off the night. I, I like what this game puts forward. As I've already said several times, I found myself really sort of like, not dreading I guess, but I was just sort of like, alright, so the game wants to be Zelda. And that's a very, very high pedestal to set yourself to, especially when you've got a small team, you're an indie developer, and you're developing for a mobile platform. But honestly, the computer port thus far has been pleasurable to play. I've enjoyed my time spent in this world. It's been... It's been agreeable with me. It hasn't set me off. There's been a few little things that we'll talk about at the end when we do our pros and cons that I think I'd like to bring up. But as of right now, let's just continue the storyline because the next part is very, very important. Next morning it is, down some stairs. I don't know if I would put my tent. I guess he was being smart. He was putting his tent on high ground. I don't know. I prefer to stay out of the rain, so I tend to be in little valleys and gullies like this that are slightly upraised so that you don't have to worry about flooding. Like, you don't want to be all the way down in the valley or all the way down in the gully. But simultaneously, eh, I don't really like the high ground either. Oop, we got ourselves a mob over here. Let's see if we can take him out. 
Oh, you just got worked. This got worked, little clockwork beast. I was going to use another word for alliteration, but I stopped myself. I try to keep it PG-13 around here. Get dealt with, mechanical monstrosity. Thank you, kid. The necklace must have attracted these dark creatures, just as your father feared. Monsters and evil forces have disturbed the balance of the world. Your destiny is tied to Oceanhorn, just like your father's. It's no use to hide any longer. Old scriptures tell about sacred emblems, relics that hold the power of gods. Their purpose was to maintain the balance of the world, but they lost their power in the catastrophe at the same time as Oceanhorn appeared. I believe that was no coincidence. To unravel the mystery of Oceanhorn, you must find out what happened to the sacred emblems. Here is what I know of them. The emblem of Earth that belongs to the Auru people is hidden in the Perta Desert that was once a vast and beautiful forest. Most of its beauty withered along with the Aurus, wise and fearless bird people. The emblem of ocean belongs to Gilfolk, the people living in the waters of the world. Emblem of ocean is a relic of their long past glory and former power. The emblem of sun was the pride of Arcadia, a symbol of hope and determination for our kind. I will tell you more about it later. It is time to begin your journey. Seek the sacred emblems. This is the only way to get to Oceanhorn and find out what happened to your father. You can learn about the islands of the uncharted seas from your father's notebook. First, you should go and talk to people on Tikarel Island. Take this key. It opens the door to the pier where your boat is kept. Godspeed. Why did you lock in my boat? Did you try and impound my vehicle? It's a good thing you share an affinity for crotch diamonds on your tunics, because frankly, if it weren't for that, if it weren't for that, I'd give you that knuckle sandwich. I saw a chest down here. I saw a chest. Can we swim that in time? I'm gonna try. Swimming is dangerous in this game, so be careful about it. Sometimes it doesn't go the way that you planned. What have we got? Yeah! Five gold coins. The chest seems a little extravagant for such a small amount of treasure, but no complaints from my peanut gallery. I'm gonna keep mine silent. Let's get out on the open sea. First, we have to slay this little spiky beast. I thought that the dock was going to be a little bit closer. Unfortunately, there are no physicians within reach. Off we ride. Well, off we float, I guess. Here we go. And so, welcome to the main part of the game. You're going to spend a lot of time sailing. Can you hear me, kid? It's me, Hermit. I could talk to you through this mysterious seashell. You know, your parents named you Hermit. Did they ever expect anything better from you? I don't know. I feel like if you name your kid Hermit, it's kind of setting them out to be a hermit. He can help us on our quest with his Whisper Shell, that's all. So this is the world map, and I love the way that things come up out of the ocean as you discover them. So for right now, the world's going to feel very, very empty. But as we go through the game, we're going to start populating it with islands. And so the things that you see are not necessarily the things that you're going to get. Let's say that when we go over here to Tikarel, so let's get sailing. You don't get to control the sailing, unfortunately, which is actually one of my major complaints. I really wish that you got to freely sail around, but I'm going to guess that there was maybe like an engine constraint or something like that that kept them from doing it because it seems like such a fairly obvious thing to me to omit from the game. Like, I want to sail freely. Ahoy! It's a beautiful day! Have a safe trip! And so there's a guy right there. I don't know where he's headed. He's going to crash into that island. Yeah, you crashed into the island, didn't you? See, less time waving and looking at passersby and more time navigating, and that probably wouldn't have happened to you. But nonetheless, I really like the fact that the game includes sailing and moving in between physical islands. That's pretty cool. And I like the way that it's not all revealed for you from the beginning. You actually have to, like, sail around the game and talk to people and find maps and stuff before the islands will actually begin to exist, which is kind of an interesting feature. But it's a fun game. I like it so far. It gives you just enough free roam exploration versus enough kind of, like, contained puzzle solving and dungeon diving to keep you interested, at least to keep me interested, and I think what they've tried to emulate, they've done reasonably well at. But I like this. That's the only change that I would make right now. Uh, the only change that I would make right now is that we could just like sail around if I could avoid getting tongue-tied and repeating myself in an embarrassing fashion. 
So to Tikarel Island we go. There are challenges at every island. Those challenges will reward you with XP and gold, which will unlock further things along. Wonderful little village. You know, this was the life I always imagined for myself. There's no time to rest, though. I'll just ask for directions and move along. Our dad is Jack's tellering us right now. Essentially, we're trying to live the storyline, and he keeps interjecting with storyline bits. We're gonna have to talk to people, so let's go up into houses and see if we can find a few more locations. This may be the last location. Oh, there's a big old rat over here. It's got a giant snuffler, so it's kind of cute. I love rats, personally. In real life, I've, I've never had a pet rat, but my friends had them. I never had a pet rat because my mom and my parents weren't... My mom and my dad weren't down with rats in the house, but... I love rats. They're... I don't think they're, like, adorable, but they're brilliant little creatures. I like that about them, the fact that they're survivors. Aren't bombs just wonderful? You can use them to open up new paths and blow up blocking objects. You should buy them at Bomb Island if you have a chance. So there it is. Bomb Island will be revealed. Last year, I took part in this stupid trip to Withered Lands. I was hoping to see an Auru Temple, but all I saw was empty wasteland, and I got sand in my boots and burned my skin. Why would anybody want to go there? And so there's Withered Lands. The Festival of Sun is an important tradition for us. It predates even the catastrophe. There's no such darkness in the world that would keep us from celebrating Sol, our goddess. I guess that's going to be your sole concern. It's the sole thing that you're looking forward to right now? Ha! <laughs> there it is. Related humor. There is a little bit of a V-Sync issue right there. I have the V-Sync turned on right now, but every now and again you get like a nasty little bit of tearing, and it just seems to happen. That's going to be a no-sell for some people. All the fish are scared of the restless beast that has been seen in these waters. When the night comes, you can hear its ancient sound that drains the joy out of you. Unless, let me go ahead and I'm going to check and make sure that the V-Sync is still on. Maybe it didn't save its settings. Hold on a second. Yes, indeed, the V-Sync is still on, so you still get tearing even when the V-Sync's on, and I know that's going to bother some people that are sort of like graphical purists. It bothers me as well. I'm not a fan of it. It is it is what it is. Welcome to my shop. What would you like to have? Well, there's a number of things here, but most of them are not going to be unlocked as of right now. You do get mana and like fire spells and things like that later on that you can use to interact with puzzles and set flames and do things like that. There's a whole bunch of stuff in this game that, like I said, directly emulates Zelda and Alundra, and I think that that works to its benefit. This is not a super ambitious title. The emulation of those previous titles is ambitious in and of itself, so attempting to innovate in this situation I think may have detracted from the small development team's ability to properly get the foundations of the gameplay in place, and so I understand why they didn't go too far outside their own reaches here. I love the atmosphere of this place. You can even see the Sky Island when the weather is good. And so Sky Island is that thing that we sailed past. Not original namers around here, but you know, it's a functional name. It works. Let's see, we need it. I think I've talked to everybody here that's going to give you useful stuff. And before you can advance any further, I think you need to get yourself... Ah, challenge accomplished. So there it is. We may have leveled up. Did we? Maybe? No, we didn't. But let's go back to our ship for right now. And once we get back to the ship, what we want to do is go to Bomb Island, which is next on our list. There is a sort of chronological way that you want to go in between the islands. It's one by one. And each island, you're going to have to do a little bit of exploration to figure out how to get there. But along the way, the game's not going to tell you what you necessarily have to do next. You've just sort of got to, like, boat around, explore islands. And as you find the bombs, it'll unlock other areas on other islands. And then it'll unlock events on previous islands. And so you see what I mean? You sort of want to do a little bit of exploration. You don't want to sit around for too long. Long, just sort of like resting on your laurels for right now bomb island is going to be the next important place that we want to go and as we explore bomb island i'll talk about our pros and cons so the pros of this game is the presentation i really like how graphically with a small team they've managed to make everything look good there's the perfect amount of i suppose lightheartedness being mixed with darkness and despair the world is obviously not an amazing place in this world a, catastro a catastrophe has befallen and so this is the last fragments of society of what used to exist. At the same time, the art style and the way that the world is represented is like, it's very childlike. I enjoy the fact that it reminds me sort of of not really like Ocarina of Time or any of those games, but it reminds me of Wind Waker, I guess would be the one that it reminds me of, or any of the more childlike Zelda games where they decided to use some of the old school little kid type graphics, I guess would be the way that I would describe them. I guess graphics uh, graphics for kids doesn't sound right, though, too, because it's a specific style that they've given, and I don't want to give it sort of like a negative detractor like that. They but say this was the place where Triloth was excavated. Now people come here either to work mines or buy bombs. They say you should never enter caves or dungeons without some bombs. Could be some puzzles in there, I guess. And so there it is. He's finished his monologue, but from what I was saying, I... I I can't really call it anything other than childlike graphics, I suppose. 
because I like it. I think that it's presented in exactly the way that a game like this should be presented. You don't want it to be ultra photo realistic because then it kind of like breaks the tie between this game and Zelda and all those other games. What do they have in common? Well, they all tend to stay away from ultra real graphics. They tend to be very stylized, very cartoony, and I like the way that this game has come across. Now, there are going to be other things about the graphics that I would say are detractors, or at least they kind of like take away from the experience. As you can see right now, the animations are a little bit limited. The animations are what they are, and my guess is that they didn't have anybody on the staff that like specializes in the animations, or maybe they had to operate within the graphical constraints of the iOS. I'm not really sure why, but the animations in this game are very, very rudimentary. The ones that you're going to see the most, like your character Character running around and your character swinging are they're good enough but some of the animations from the monsters and during the cinematics could have been done a little bit better and so I suppose while we're talking about the good parts of the graphics we should also talk about you know the negative parts and so that's just what I've noticed along the way other things that I've liked about the game thus far the soundtrack is surprisingly good for a game that was developed by what seems like three or four guys whoever it was I guess it announced his name at the beginning I think it was his name Oh, I can't remember now. I think the team is Finnish from the names that I saw at the beginning. When I was walking on a hill nearby, I fell into a hole. I saw something shimmering in the dark, but I was too afraid to find out what it was and climbed up quickly. The soundtrack is very, very good. The controls are tight and they feel pretty good. I think the combat can be a tiny bit wonky sometimes, and so just be aware that occasionally, based on your cursor position and things like that, you may have a couple of fights that don't quite go the way that you want them to. Still, by and large, in the general experience of the game, I haven't had too many things go ridiculously wrong. It's just every now and again I take a hit because, you know, my mouse is in a weird spot and... I don't know, every now and again my brain shuts down and I start thinking about my attacks as going the direction my character is facing or in the direction that the key is holding rather than, you know, clicking around like that. So that's going to be kind of a dysfunction on my end rather than a dysfunction on the part of the game. As far as the gameplay goes, the game, like I said before, emulates everything very, very faithfully that you're going to find in a Zelda, a Lundra, or Is or Wise title. It's going to have bombs, it's going to have arrows, it's going to have, you know, generic magic, it's going to have, you know, these random little trinkets that you have to run around and collect and eventually plug into some shrine or something like that. The things that you're going to see here are not necessarily going to be super original. Still, the recreation of all of those gameplay mechanics is done pretty faithfully and pretty well for a team that's very, very small. And so thus far, I've been surprised by this game. If you've been interested in the game thus far, I'd recommend checking it out. It hasn't come out as of the time of the publication of this review. However... It will be coming out on St. Paddy's Day of 2015. So on March 17th, it's going to come out on Steam with the full computer port of the iOS game. So if you enjoyed what you've seen here today and you feel like the production is worthy of your dosh and coins, I'd say stop on by. Give it a go. There's not a whole lot of PC competitors for Zelda-like games. And so I do really think that there is room for this title in the PC offerings on Steam, and so hopefully, really, at the end of the day, what I could say about this game is that while it does have its ups and its downs, we can level up right now so you can see what that's like. We are now a traveler, we get 10 coins for free. And so there it is, you get little bonuses for leveling up. These right here are collectibles. You take them back to Tacoma Island or Tacola Island or wherever hell, then Tomoka or whatever the name that island was, and there's a little cave hidden in the back of the island. You turn these into this guy and they're collectibles, and as you get to certain you know, amounts of collectibles. He'll be like, oh, that's super awesome. Hooray. That falls in right there, which is what I was going to show you. But yeah, there's collectibles. There's lots of little things to occupy yourself with. The puzzles are exactly what you expect. Lots of block moving and generally some manipulation of magic to get through. And honestly, what this game has done for me, Ocean Horn has made me wonder what they're going to do with their next title. I really do hope they manage to make enough money from this game to where they can make another game, maybe with a little bit larger of a team and a little bit larger of a budget, because this game is... Sp the things that the game offers are sparse. You're you're not going to get anything new from this game that you're not going to get out of, you know, Zelda or any other game. But the fact of the matter that you can say that about a game made by three guys or four guys is a big deal, to be honest, because Zelda is a major AAA production. And so for all of its foibles, it does what it set out to do pretty well, and it leaves me interested to see the way that they'll innovate in their next title. So my name is Splattercat. The game that we play today in Weekly Indie Newcomer was called Oceanhorn, Monster of the Uncharted Seas. It is the computer port. I don't, I haven't played it on the iPhone, so I have no idea what the difference is going to be between the mobile versions and between the computer versions. From what I understand on the forums from the other people that have played both, they've said that it's been upgraded considerably. I can't give you a checklist on the 
those, unfortunately, because I don't have the iOS version or the mobile version. So there it is. My name is Splattercat. This series is called Weekly Indie Newcomer. It's going to be reworked in the future, I think. But for right now, it's my Friday series where we hang out and talk about an indie game that I've been playing over the course of the last week. I just give you some of my thoughts and as to whether I feel like it's worth it. In general, I tend to cover games that are positive because I don't like to say mean things about somebody's life work or something that might be special to somebody that's making their creation. So if a game is bad, I don't tend to feature it. So you're not going to see a whole lot of review, or you're not going to see a whole lot of negative reviews in this particular series. But at the same time, I do offer some critique as well, just in case the developers swing on through, and so they can see my thoughts about the way the game came out. My name is Splattercat. I will see you all later. Thank you for joining me here today. I'm going to get hit by a sword for a little while, and I look forward to seeing you all in next week's episode. Hi, do everybody.